नमस्कार टुडे विल बी डिस्कसिंग एन इम्पॉर्टेंट एंड इंटरेस्टिंग सब्जेक्ट सोशल साइंसेस यू नो सोशल साइंसेस दैट यू आर स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम द एलिमेंट्री लेवल कंसिस्ट ऑफ डिसिप्लिनस लाइक हिस्ट्री जोग्रफी पोलिटिकल साइंस एंड इकनॉमिक्स पेडेगोजी ऑफ सोशल साइंसेस फॉर द निष्ठा प्रोग्राम ड्रॉज एक्सपर्टीज फ्रॉम डिफरेंट डिसिप्लिन ऑफ द सब्जेक्ट वी हैव आर एक्सपर्ट फ्रॉम पोलिटिकल साइंस प्रोफेसर शंकर शरण वी हैव एक्सपर्ट इन द फील्ड ऑफ जोग्रफी प्रोफेसर अपर्णा पांडे वी हैव एन एक्सपर्ट इन द फील्ड ऑफ इकोनॉमिक्स डॉक्टर श्रीनिवासन यू नो दैट दिस सब्जेक्ट वीव्स अक्रॉस टाइम स्पेस एंड इंस्टीट्यूशन इट स्टडीज द ह्यूमन इंटरेक्शन विद नेचर एंड सोशल एनवायरमेंट अक्रॉस different time span how should we make the subject interesting and engaging so that you can adopt it as a, pr- a profession in your later life as you know social sciences that you are studying is interconnected with different subjects like as i said history geography political science and economics it draws interrelationship across these discipline if you take any theme that interests you so today we will be discussing about how to make the subject interesting we have expertise drawn from uh, political science geography economics and history so we will tell you how to make the subject interesting so that you find it uh, the, a, a subject that you would like to choose uh, as a hobby as a career as well as the one that you can research upon so we will first talk about making it interesting through the teaching of geography we have with us professor aparna bas uh, aparna pande who is an expert in this field of geography she will tell you how to make the subject interesting through some of the tried pedagogical strategies professor aparna pande thank you professor shivastha as uh, professor shivastav has already mentioned that uh, in social sciences there are four subject and geography is one of the components of social sciences geography is a challenging subject no doubt but there are diff- various reasons for this this is a subject which is a bridge between natural sciences and social sciences because geography draws 50% of its contents from natural sciences so teachers sometimes face challenge how to transact subject matter of geography for students without oversimplifying or distorting the facts or phenomena in the module which we have included in this manual is based on location location is one of the core concepts of geography through latitude and longitude we identify the exact or a specific location on the globe or on the map or in atlas in this module we have included several activities to make the students participative participative in teaching learning process our objective is that at this stage a student must learn how to use geographical vocabulary while explaining any concept or any phenomena whether natural or social on the earth surface here assessment through our the module we have tried to integrate it with teaching learning process quiz has been included and s- students can identify location on satellite imageries which are available on web portal school bhuvan ncert they can identify why this location is unique because evidence have proved that when students are given freedom to explore the world around them higher order thinking skills may be developed here we have tried to explain that a student should be given freedom to explore the globe on their own teachers just they have to help them to identify teachers get aroused their curiosity by asking some questions where do we live on the globe and you will find that most of the students will say that on inside the globe then 
teacher will have to adopt interdisciplinary approach by explaining gravitational force. So, we have tried to make this module very interesting, try to make this concept interesting and comprehensible by using several activities. I think that you will enjoy while doing these activities with the students. Okay. Uh, now, we move to a discussion on pedagogy of political science, which uh, you must be studying. So, we request our esteemed colleague, Professor Shankar Sharan, to tell us about how to make the subject interesting. Oh, thank you, madam. Uh, before I go to the module and activity, I must uh, tell something which are very basic, especially for teaching political science and teaching at the school level. As we all know that uh, political science is the study of uh, government, politics, society. But it is an important subject, but it is not an easy subject. So what is difficult about it? Especially as I understand that the subject requires some experience of life to understand it in its, in its um, full scope. So at the school level, we must uh, keep in mind as a teacher that uh, we should be content that we, uh, our students should understand the terms, the concepts, the processes as clearly as possible. So our motto should be that uh, uh, learning bet, uh, fewer but better because you cannot uh, achieve more at this stage of life because for instance like ethics or philosophy so this uh, this subject is limited by the capacity of the learner before you understand the so many problems of political and social sphere you should have to have certain experience of life therefore a teacher must keep in mind that the grammar of politics at the school level must be understood first because this subject is endless, controversies and problems are endless. So how our students should tackle it all? So that should be a, a, a point must be kept in mind all the times. So I would say that there is a structure called uh, loosely grammar of politics and it comprises political terms, political institutions and political theory. So the, our students should have the clear understanding of political terms, all the terms which we use in our textbooks, in our discussions, in our presentations. We should keep in mind that students must understand it very clearly, cleanly to be used whenever the occasion arises so that they should not use it uh, loosely or haphazardly or without understanding it. So this is the first point. Second is political institutions. So simply uh, take, for instance, legislature, executive, judiciary, the broad institutions. There are other institutions which are associated with it. So what is the anatomy of it? What exactly is legislature? What it is named? How it is looks like? What are its duties? What are their limitations? What is the difference or the separation of power between legislature, executive, judiciary? All these in its basic, most standard meaning must be clear to students at the first. And then comes the political theory. Essentially speaking, this is uh, a topic or a theme for a higher stage. As I said earlier, that uh, a certain experience of life is necessary to understand the political issues, problems, and processes. So the political theory helps to understand the facts of life from right or standard perspective how to analyze problems, how to analy analyze certain events or certain decisions. Because if you don't have the grounding in political theory, then any decision can be explained or analyzed as, uh, as one likes. As you, as you see every day, a government takes a decision and certain people uh, likes it, other people don't like it. And you will see that it is very difficult to decide who is right, who is, who is wrong, or what is the essence of it. So political theory helps to understand these kind of issues, which is, as I said, is a, a matter of higher stage, but the students must be given a hint that this is important, because political theory helps you to understand the issues, problems, phenomena, whatever is happening all over the world. 
So these three components, as I say, is grammar of politics. So the clarity about it must be there. And one more thing that in politics we use terms which have very different meanings. And uh, as a common example, we can read newspapers or television channel debates that the certain concept, a certain, uh, for example, take even an article of constitution, they are interpreted in different manners. And this is true for so many concepts also, like secularism, nationalism, fascism, democracy, human rights, duties, uh, governments, and so on and so forth. So all these terms or concepts are used or explained in different manners. So at the school stage, it is important to give the most standard, authentic understanding so that they can move on, the students can move on to understand the political process and institutions in a most standard and perfect manner as far as possible. So this is, this is something which every teacher should keep in mind. And in this, uh, in this module, we have, for example, given an um, uh, activity of uh, mock parliament. Through this mock parliament, this is just an example. Through this mock parliament, the students can be uh, made to understand how this supreme institution of our legislature works, who are the um, players in this parliament, what are the uh, processes used in running the parliament, what is called the zero hour, what is called the question hour, what is the uh, situation and power of uh, leader of the house, leader of the opposition, and so many other things. So through this mock parliament, we have tried to explain how a teacher can use activities to explain the terms and processes and problems. And of course, uh, every teacher will use his own skill or resources uh, depending upon the um, availability of situation or even the location. In a remote village, a teacher will explain the same term, same theme in a different way. In a metro city, the teacher will explain the same issues perhaps in a different way. So this depends on the ability of the teacher and the available resources. But I think these issues and this uh, activity has to be devised as a uh, situation um, provides it. Now I think uh, our colleague, Mr. Uh, Dr. Srinivasan, will explain uh, something about the economic aspect of social science. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Shankar Sharam. And Srinivasan, I, I, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, many topics in social sciences and uh, many of these topics are also taught from the interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, in our uh, uh, NISHTA uh, program, we have one um, uh, theme, something called pedagogy of social sciences. Within pedagogy of social sciences, we have something called livelihoods. What is this livelihoods? Livelihoods is basically the, the study about how people make a living, how people engage in various occupations actually. If you look at NCF, uh, this is based on the, the guiding principle of NCF National Curriculum Framework 2005, which suggests that please connect the school curriculum with life outside school. So keeping this guiding principle in mind, the, the new syllabus got developed and within the new syllabus, uh, the, the erstwhile civics has been replaced with the social and political life. Within the social and political life, there are various themes under which livelihoods is also one theme. The children who studied livelihoods may think that why this kind of new term is used. They can simply say occupations. But if you look at livelihoods as a, as a term which has a uh, which has lot of interdisciplinary component, how it can be taught in, in an interesting manner. One way that we have also presented in the module is that uh, children can be exposed to the notice, uh, noticing the occupations. The, uh, at the first class or in the first period, maybe the teachers can um, provide visuals, various visuals um, of various occupations. So children can see those occupations and they can be familiarized. These are the occupations, for example, mansion, construction worker, grocery shop owner, or a shopping complex. So people engage in various occupations through visuals can be shown. That could be one activity where children can uh, notice it actually. As a second kind of activity in the area of livelihoods, that children can be asked to draw occupations. They can go out, you can see that children are using a lot of um, art as integrated discipline, like art as a 
part of social sciences. So, they can be encouraged to draw by observing people. They can go out or they may be asked to observe uh, some of the occupations outside their school on a, on, a, on a vacation. So, they can come back to the school, the teacher can guide them to draw. Uh, those uh, faces, so pe what people, what occupations people are doing actually. So, once they draw and then they will have an idea about various occupations, for example, a doctor or a say a driver or a auto rickshaw owner, like auto rickshaw driver or a vegetable vendor. So, children can draw various occupations that they depending on where they live. For example, uh, children living in villages, they may draw uh, different occupations. Children living in the cosmopolitan, they may draw differently actually. So, these occupations can be captured and the teachers can increase them or those occupations, those these drawings can be colored, they can put on the wall wallpapers like in the posters, in the form of posters actually. Okay. So, if they are put on the uh, uh, classroom walls, that will be interesting uh, kind of uh, observation children can then in a school of like in a class of 40 students, if 40 occupations are coming in the form of visuals, that will make great appeal among the students. The third kind of activity is taking the children to the um, outside school through a mini survey. I also noticed many teachers are doing in their social science classrooms. They, they write like they uh, post some five, six questions uh, to the students and uh, ask them to go back to their home, consult their parents and collect the details uh, of various occupations. For example, I noticed also that many children come to me and then they asked me what occupation I am doing actually. So, I, I explained. They asked me a series of other questions also, how much you are paid, how many hours you are working, uh, what are the holidays, are you getting pension and so on. So, children can be asked to go and collect details about various occupations people are engaged in actually. So, when they bring it uh, to the classroom, teacher can put it a proper a, a kind of tabulating all this data and also they can raise a debate. For example, there are some occupations which are paid very high salary, there are some occupations in which they paid very low salary, there are some occupations people get like their own earning through self-employment. So, children can be encouraged to observe those occupations, talk to the people engaged in those occupations. So, once they bring it in the classroom, children can be encouraged to discuss and debate why these occupations are paid very high, why they are, they are paid very low actually. So, in this way, like uh, teachers can encourage uh, children to observe those occupations so that the, the concept of livelihoods and the related concepts are also can become very clear. In this process, various economic concepts, political science concepts may can be made uh, made uh, intelligible at this level. For example, what is wages, what is profit, what is uh, profit margin, what is the cost, what is the revenue, what is the transport cost. Children will come across when they conduct a mini survey actually. So, in this way, livelihood uh, theme is an interesting theme which is interdisciplinary that can make the social science classroom very lively and they can also connect to their life, the life outside the school system. A few uh, things I would uh, like to add uh, here yes. that uh, livelihood because this can be, teacher can adopt interdisciplinary approach while discussing livelihood yeah. because in different geographical location livelihood occupations will be different. So, uh, students can collect photographs, they can collect information from different yeah. areas like hilly, hilly areas occupation will be different in uh, coastal areas or plains. So, this will, this may be a very interesting activity to explain the concept yes, in right. the class. Yeah, and taking from Aparna, we can go back to the domain of history because when you trace about the livelihoods, you can see why in a particular region, people have opted for a particular livelihood. Uh, as you know, history is also an important subject in social sciences. So, whatever has transpired has a past, it has a history. And how do we know? Because we have not lived those ages. We have not lived at that time, point of time. And therefore, we uh, uh, look at our sources. As you all know, that when you read themes like the Harappan civilization or you read themes that interest you like the history of freedom struggle, then how do you know about it? It is through sources and sources are important for us to understand our past, to know how people have contributed, to know the linkages between history, geography, uh, political science because it depends on the question that poses that you pose and you must be talking about uh, this with your friends, sometimes uh, when your teacher is discussing, you discuss amongst yourself how these things have happened and therefore, we call this as sources. You must have seen your textbooks, there are reference to primary sources as well as secondary sources. Primary sources are sources that belong to the period that you are trying to study and sources are of different kinds. They could be literary sources, 
they could be archaeological sources, they could be inscriptions, they could be travel logs, many that will help you to unravel the past, to know how people lived, how they contributed, what was the sources of livelihood, how did they meet challenges of life and how did they uh, contribute to inventions. If you want to understand the time gap, for example, if you take a paper and you just start posing a question, what was it that uh, was used for writing in the past? Then you can come to know that people were writing on birch barks and this kind of, uh, you know, the time span that has gone into the making of a particular invention is dialoguing with the past to understand continuity and change. In the pedagogy of social sciences, we want you to involve each and every students to know that understanding the past is not just by undertaking a source, but by multiplicity of sources to draw inferences. Now, your school must be located in a village or a district, but definitely it has some sources uh, that you can think about it that throws light on local history. And for that, you can evolve different methodologies like taking the children for a field visit to a monument or to a museum and then asking them to work in groups and penning their thought in form of a project or a small essay to see how you get connected with this, these monument. How will you conserve it? Because it's not enough to know about a monument, but it's also important to conserve the heritage of our past. Then, when you are studying freedom struggle, doesn't it arouse you to know how people spoke at that point of time? I'm sure in your village or in your district, there would be somebody who would be talking about it, having some pictures in their houses. You can collect those pictures to see, oh, somebody from my family must have participated. Or you could have uh, some speech of some of your elders in the family, which may be recorded or which may be told by a piece of mouth, which we call, it, call as oral repository, to know what people, how people participated, what they thought. Probably if you are interested in a sense of dressing, to know what people used to dress up. Now, you know India has different regions and people wear different clothes. They have geography, they have economics in it, mm -hmm. because when you yeah. talk about how much it costed, and of course, uh, it could have element of governance because if you have this Swadeshi movement, it had all the components that integrated across subjects. So, sources are so important, but at the same time, you must know how to interpret them, how to analyze them because that is the way you understand our past. It is an interpretative subject, definitely, because if my sources are limited, my interpretations will be in, uh, limited. Therefore, it is always better to collect more and more sources because it also shows your interest, your curiosity, your imagination and your sense of reflecting. And therefore, collecting sources is important. Now, many times you have seen books, paintings, you must have gone to museums and you must have seen cartoons, you must have seen pictures, you must have seen various forms of how these presentation of our sources take place. Yeah. Read them and try to analyze how you understand them. This is how your sense of interpretation develops. Yeah. So, social sciences is a subject that can be studied in depth across subject. It has interrelationship and definitely you will find it interesting because a lot of human values can be developed through this like empathy, respect for diversity, equity, equality, concern for gender and peace-oriented uh, uh, values can be culled out through each of the disciplines that we are studying. Yeah. Make it enjoyable, interesting and stimulating. That is what our pedagogy on social sciences attempts to. It is not complete because no pedagogy can be prescriptive. It has to be designed by you as per your context, as per the language that the child understands, so that this subject becomes truly rich as a, a discipline as well as something that you can take up as a research in your later life. Pedagogy of social sciences therefore has attempted to give you in a nutshell some of the participatory activities that you can include while teaching and delivering the subjects to students. You may reflect yourself 
and see whether you are following it or whether you want to add on to what we have said. But at the end, we should all try to make the subject engaging so that the students try to draw interrelationship within and across the discipline to understand natural and social environment. Thank you so much for